Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Novartis. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Hello, I'm Vladimir Tesla, Head of Department of Nephrology in General University Hospital in Prague, Czechia. My long-term interest is glomerular disease. And I have been involved in many randomized controlled trials in patients with different glomeropathies and also in several studies dedicated to complement inhibition in anchor-associated vasculitis, IgA nephropathy, T3 glomeropathy, and also in membranous nephropathy. Welcome to this program titled Looking Ahead in Complement Mediated Kidney Diseases. What clinical questions do current trials aim to answer? Joining me today is Smita Sina. Hello. Hi. Uh, Smita is a consultant nephrologist at Salford Royal Hospital in the United Kingdom. She leads the glomerulonephritis service at Salford Royal, which is an integrated clinical and research clinic serving a population of about 1.5 million inhabitants. In today's discussion, we will address current unmet needs in the management of patients with complement mediated kidney disease. And then, even more interestingly, imagine targeted th uh, therapies for complement mediated kidney diseases. Before we move on, let me give you a brief overview of what are complement mediated kidney diseases, focusing on C3 glomeropathy, atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, and IgA nephropathy. There are three complement pathways of, uh, in which the complement is activated uh, so called classical pathway lectin pathway and alternative pathway, and all these pathways finally merge on the activation of C3 and C5. And uh, finally, C5B9 is produced, which works as membrane attack complex. Here you see that uh, each of these pathways is activated in another way, classical pathway mostly uh, by immune complexes, um, lectin pathway uh, by different products of kidney damage and alternative pathway, for instance, by different bacteria. And uh, you, you, concerning the individual diseases we are to discuss, I would start with C3G, which is a typical disease caused by dysregulation of alternative complement pathway. It is a, a very rare disease with an incidence of about one to two patients per one million inhabitants. But it is important because um, it has a very poor long-term outcome in terms of renal function, which you can see here on the study in children. There was a, something like 25% survival after 15 years, renal survival after 15 years of follow-up. And uh, we have now ongoing trial uh, with uh, factor BB inhibitor eptacopan in C3G glomerulate, and you will hear about it later. Concerning atypical AUS is a part of more complex group of diseases, which is called thrombotic microangiopathies, but we will then concentrate only on these thrombotic microangiopathies, which are caused by the, by the mutation of complement, especially complement inhibitors. And uh, these are called atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. Here you see the damage caused by uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome to the kidney. Uh, and uh, what is important is that uh, this is a rare, potentially life-threatening disease uh, which results untreated almost always in the complete loss of kidney function. And it is not so difficult to diagnose it when we are aware of it because it's a quite rare combination of uh, sudden se severe thrombocytopenia and anemia with um, uh, signs of hemolysis and uh, increased serum uh, creatinine or completely developed kidney failure requiring dialysis. In atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, we have already established treatment 
with C5 inhibitor ecolizumab or more recently also with ravulizumab, which dramatically improve the outcome of the disease. As you can see here, the data from two randomized controlled trials, ecolizumab almost completely normalizes uh, platelet count and almost immediately uh, does so. And uh, there is also a gradual improvement of kidney function in most patients. What is important is that the treatment should start as early as possible because delayed treatment may be ineffective because of irreversible damage to the kidney. In IG nephropathy, which is a disease which, is, uh, which has quite com complex uh, pathogenesis caused by several hits, uh, there is also a part played by a complement, and uh, there are some studies looking at complement modulation in this disease. Uh, coming back to pathogenesis, uh, IG nephropathy is uh, primarily caused by the inappropriate uh, production or an inappropriate um, coming into uh, blood circulation of um, uh, a, a, a galactose deficient IgA producing the gut. Uh, there are autoantibodies produced against this galactose deficient IgA, and then immunocomplexes uh, are formed and uh, deposited in the kidney, resulting also in the activation of complement and in kidney damage. And uh, it is a uh, much more frequent disease, which can uh, finally result after a long uh, time to uh, in um, uh, end stage renal disease. The complement may be activated, activated in IG nephropathy at different levels, but alternative pathway is activated all in almost 90% of patients, so its inhibition is definitely of utmost importance. And one of the factors of alternative pathway factor B is uh, associated with uh, proteinuria and negatively with kidney function, and uh, also positive staining for factor BB in the kidney is present in IgA nephropathy, but not in some other glomerular diseases. Uh, it is not only about uh, alternative pathway. Uh, there, there are data showing that lectin pathway is also important in IgA nephropathy, which can be quite easily assessed based on the studying of C4D deposition in the kidney, which is increased in some patients. It has important impact for the outcome of the patients, that these patients with um, C4 deposits had um, uh, increased risk of the progression of kidney disease and the development of end-stage renal disease. There are several studies um, uh, in, uh, ongoing in IgA nephropathy, and among them, there are two major studies uh, dedicated to complement inhibition, one to uh, alternative pathway inhibition with iptacopan and one to lectin pathway inhibition with nasoplimab, and we will once again hear about it much more later. So this was a short overview and now Smita, what are the current unmet needs in the management of patients with complement mediated kidney disease? Oh, thanks Vladimir. Um, so I think the best way to describe the unmet need is to actually take it back to a patient. Um, so this is um, a patient of mine, um, slightly, obviously changed the name slightly, uh, but this is John um, and he presented to our service in 2015 as, as with many patients with IgA nephropathy, it's incidental. Um, he was involved in a road traffic accident and they noticed he had hematuria. Um, he was slightly overweight and when we looked at his biochemistry he had elevated urinary protein um, but his kidney function was good so um, we did a biopsy which actually didn't look too bad um, at, first, at first glance but as you can see, things did not go well for John. Um, the top uh, graph shows his proteinuria and the bottom graph shows his um, renal function, um, so his estimated GFR. And what you can see is we did try to intervene. So we tried supportive care to start with, but his kidney function and proteinuria did not respond. So we then tried steroids. And the proteinuria, you can see, it does respond as we would expect. Um, so two courses of steroids, um, well, three in the end, um, and then some SGLT2 inhibitors as that data became available. Um, but despite the improvement in proteinuria, the bottom graph clearly shows a consistent progressive decline in kidney function. And I think this is why there's so much unmet need in patients with IgA nephropathy. Despite our best efforts, things get worse. So we really do need something else. Um, and for John, 
he's now going to participate mm -hmm. in a clinical trial. Uh, so hopefully things will improve. Thank you very much for this very practical overview. I, I think that we know many similar patients who were responding in some way, but finally progressed to end-stage kidney disease. And uh, there is definitely an unmet need. So what could you tell us about the burden of the diseases? Yeah, so um, as, you, as, as you described earlier, mm -hmm. I run a, a specialist clinic, mm -hmm. so um, it feels like the burden of disease I see every day. Um, but I'm going to start with C3G. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is particularly difficult for us because it affects all ages. Um, we know that um, with people who've got dense deposit disease, um, they, they seem to be slightly um, um, younger than people with C3 glomerulonephritis, but the prognosis is still poor. It's a rare disease, as you said early, um, and what we know is that people will progress to end-stage kidney disease in, in 10 years. Um, and even if they get a transplant, mm -hmm. the disease can recur in up to 50%. So it's a problem that just does not go away. Um, from a treatment perspective, KDGO does make some recommendations, but it's largely supportive. Um, they do rec recommend glucocorticoids mm -hmm. for those patients with progressive disease, but again, 30 to 50% of people still progress to end-stage kidney disease. Um, so there is um, a need for more to be done for these patients, even though the disease is very rare. If we then look at atypical HUS, so this is, most nephrologists will recognize atypical HUS as a complement mediated disease, um, even though it's very rare, our knowledge is pretty good on it. And we recognize that although it's rare, um, its prognosis was terrible. Um, so prior to the advent of, advent of co complement inhibitors, um, we, we knew that a lot of patients ended up with end-stage kidney disease, and very rapidly, as you described earlier. Um, but that has changed and we have got treatments. We have um, ecolizumab now um, and that has fundamentally changed how we manage these people. So we recognize these patients and we refer them on to an appropriate center so that they can access treatment. The problem at the moment is we don't know how long to carry treatment on for um, and you know we're always looking for other options. So we now have ravaluzumab, um, so that allows a bit more convenient dosing, um, but again, we still don't know when to stop. And there is a study in the UK which is currently looking at withdrawal of complement inhibition uh, for these patients. So look forward to seeing this, the results of those trials. Uh, so moving on to IgA nephropathy, so I'm going fast, uh, so <laughs> apologies, Vladimir. Um, IgA nephropathy, much more common. And if you'd asked me 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, is IgA a complement-mediated disorder? I'd have said, don't be silly. Um, but our knowledge has uh, improved significantly since then. And as you've described, it clearly is. Um, it's a lot more common than the other two diseases. Uh, you know this. Um, two and a, probably more than two and a half thousand um, per hundred thousand population. And there's variation depending on which part of the world you're from. Um, so the disease, I think we, we would agree, it's very different in the Southeast, popula Southeast mm -hmm. Asian population as it is perhaps in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a, a preponderance of men um, in the Europeans, and again, probably one-to-one -one in, in people from the Far East. Um, but nonetheless, there is a significant risk of progression. It's slower, but we still know that as, you know, almost 30% of patients do progress to end-stage kidney disease um, in 10 years. And we also know that they too have a high rate of recurrence um, in their transplant. So again, um, more disease burden and transplant, not the cure for all patients. So we've got, um, so KDGO has invested some time here um, and the guidelines have adjusted as the evidence base has changed. Um, and I think we're moving towards goal-directed therapy. And yes, supportive care might be appropriate for a lot of people, um, but depending on your individual circumstances, where you are in the world, your ethnicity, you might be more inclined to go for steroids. Um, and you know, there's, there's a few trials out there now that show a reduction in proteinuria. Um, but I think what's nice about KDGO is it recognizes that there is that proportion of patients we don't have answers to. Um, so it does specifically say, look, put your patients in a clinical trial, which I think is the appropriate thing to do. But I suspect this is the guideline that's gonna change the most in the next few years because of all the trials that we're hearing about. Um, so Vladimir, I've, uh, I've talked about the KDGO guidelines and how they're gonna change, um, and I've touched on clinical trials, but um, how do you think that those patients, um, you know, who might benefit on top of uh, supportive care, you know, why is that important for them? So it is important for different reasons. One reason is that uh, the patients are usually young, they have long survival, low potential survival, and uh, they end up in end-stage renal disease after 20 to 
up to 40 years, it still means a significant uh, limitation in the quality of life. And it was shown uh, by the Swedish data from the Swedish registry that especially because they progressed to end-stage renal disease, they have also decreased life expectancy. And of course, I would still comment on what you said about treatment. We were always uh, also very much keen to treat the patient with corticosteroids because there, is, there was nothing else. And uh, it was sometimes effective, sometimes less effective, but it is always or very frequently associated with severe adverse events, which is also the reason why we would like to avoid this treatment. Thank you. Um, yeah, you've clearly outlined why we need more than just steroids. Um, and I've seen those side effects in my patients pretty much almost on a weekly basis. Um, so we've talked about something else, and we've also heard from you about the complement cascade. But is there a particular pathway uh, which is primarily involved in these complemented, uh, complement-mediated kidney diseases? So uh, it is very much discussed, especially in IGNFopathy. So as I said, we know that classical pathway doesn't seem to play an important role. But uh, there, there is an active, activated alternative pathway in some patients and uh, in lectin pathway in some other patients. And we currently do not know what is more important and in, in which patient, uh, which pathway activated, although it is probably not so difficult to assess that. So I already mentioned that uh, there are data showing that uh, plasma levels of BA are associated with proteinuria and glomerular filtration and their deposition also is present in some patients. So this is a, a definitely a, an evidence for the activation of alternative pathway. And uh, concerning lectin pathway, we can um, uh, uh, consider the activation of lectin pathway on the, the evaluation of C4D in biopsy, which is not difficult. It is now not regularly done, but it can be introduced quite easily when we have the treatment. And uh, concerning um, CEC4G and uh, atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, this is not uh, equivocal. It's completely clear that, uh, that this alternative pathway which is activated. And so, uh, although we have now treatment uh, with uh, C5 uh, inhibitor, we would like to find some uh, other treatment which could be even more effective, more specific, and probably with less adverse events. And this is what is currently studied. The complement system is central to innate immunity and serves as first-line defense against invading pathogens. Besides, it also removes immune complexes and damaged cell cells, aids organ regeneration, confers neuroprotection, and engages with the adaptive immune response via B and T cells. Effector molecules may be activated by one of three initiating pathways, the classical, lectin, and alternative pathways, which converge on the activation of C3, a central protein to the complement cascade. C3 cleavage by protease, C3 convertase into C3A, a key inflammatory mediator, and C3B, a major opsonin of the system is the convergence point of all three complement activation pathways. The constitutively active alternative complement pathway plays a vital role in amplifying complement activation and signaling for all three pathways. This regulation of the alternative complement pathway predisposes individuals to several diseases, including atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome and C3 glomeropathy while playing an important role in other glomerular diseases, such as IgA nephropathy. The alternative pathway is constitutively activated at a low level and is therefore particularly susceptible to dysregulation. This low rate activation occurs by spontaneous hydrolysis of c swing, a process known as stickover. Once self-activated, hydrolyzed C forms a complex with vector beam thereby enabling factor D to cleave factor B. Cleave factor B in complex with hydrolyzed C3 is the initial C3 convertase of the alternative pathway, furthermore cleaving C3 into C3A and C3B, which drive inflammation and opsonization in the event of pathogen invasion. C3B can then bind to the surface of pathogens that are in close proximity via its newly exposed theoester bond, thus targeting foreign particles for phagocytosis, 
a process known as opsonization. Aside from covalently binding, C3B can also interact with surface molecules that we call C3B. The alternative pathway also plays a pivotal role in amplifying the complement response. If not adequately regulated by both soluble and membrane-bound inhibitors, inappropriate and persistent activation of the alternative pathway may result in kidney damage. It ultimately accounts for more than 80% of terminal pathway activation, regardless of the activating pathway, propagating the signal and producing large amounts of C3B. The next steps of complement activation will lead to CC convertase activation and amplification, followed by C5 convertase activation, and finally, terminal pathway activity leading to formation of the membrane attack complex. This final step generates a pore in the membrane leading to cell lysis. Complement activation can either benefit or harm the host organism thus ensuring a balance between activation on foreign or modified cell surfaces, cell surfaces and inhibition on intact host cell is crucial. Most importantly, complement regulators are essential for maintaining this balance and are classified as soluble regulators, such as factor H, including factor H-related proteins which play an antagonistic role, and membrane-bound regulators, such as membrane cofactor protein, or MCP. Another mechanism by which complement is regulated is the enzymatic inactivation of C4B and C3B, which are convertase components. For example, serine factor I can cleave and inactivate C3B and C4B in the presence of cofactors such as MCP, CRR, and factor H, and this is referred to as cofactor activity. Thanks, Vladimir. That was a pretty impressive overview of the role of the alternative pathway. Um, and for anyone who's watching this, it does get easier as you watch it again and again. And, and it does it does uh, kick in because I must admit, I've always found it really difficult. Um, but you've explained it really nicely there and really simply. So thank you so much. Um, so now that you've explained the complement pathway, um, could you perhaps talk us through some of the therapeutic targets um, that are available and some of those investigational drugs? The introduction in clinical practice of complement inhibitors was one of the most significant therapeutic achievements during the last decade. The taming of the old and powerful complement system has opened a new clinical perspective that materialized in positive outcome impact on rare gomenal diseases of the first C5 blocker, Eculizumab, and more recently Ravulizumab, but also the C3 inhibitor Pexetacoplan. If very effective, on the one hand, blockage of the terminal complement pathway and activation of membrane at a complex or MAC, on the other hand, can be deleterious, since the lytic function of MAC serves an important defense against gram-negative bacteria, enveloped viruses, and parasites. Although C5A is the primary complement chemoattractant, other complement proteins such as C3A also act as chemotactic factors for specific cell types. This breakthrough has fueled a renewed interest in the potential benefit of complement modulation across nephropathies with exclusive or predominant C3 deposits like C3 glomeropathy or with immunoglobulins, immune complexes and complement deposits like IgA nephropathy or Ig-mediated membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. The alternative pathway, notably the C3 alternative convertase, is currently attracting most of the efforts for the design and development of specific modulators, such as small molecules, danicopan, which served as blueprint to design its analog vermicopan, but also iptacopan, an effector B inhibitor currently being investigated in C3 glomeropathy, atypical HUS, and IgA nephropathy. Most of these drug inhibit central complements or activators of the C3 alternative convertase. Alternative pathway modulators are optimal tools for the treatment of glomerular diseases driven mainly or partially by the deposition of C3 activation products. Such strategy leaves direct signaling via the classical and lectin pathway intact 
thus preserving the innate immunity response to invading pathogens. Inhibitors of the initiation phases of the lectin pathway are also available or undergoing development, for instance, MASP2 inhibitor nasoplimab. Ultimately, these drugs could be used as monotherapies, but also in combination strategies aiming to the simultaneous inhibition of more than one level of the complement cascade. Now uh, that I've put these upcoming agents into perspective, could you tell us, Mita, a little bit more about these ongoing clinical trials, outcomes, and what clinical questions do these trials aim to answer? Yeah, there are so many, uh, Vladimir. I suspect by the time I finish this presentation that there will be even more coming available, but I'm going to try my best to, to summarize some of them. So I'm going to start with uh, PEGS Atacaplan, and I'm going to start with C3G. Um, so. Pegsitacaplan, it's a C3 inhibitor, um, uh, works on the alternative pathway, um, and there's been a phase two single arm study, which has shown a 65% reduction in 24 hour urinary protein excretion, stabilization in that proteinuria, and also an improvement of C3 um, over a course of 48 weeks. Um, so I think that, that study was, that phase two study was important, and there is now a phase three study looking at this therapy for patients with C3G. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to then go on to another study, um, again in C3G. This is Eptacapan, which you mentioned early. Again, alternative pathway. This is a factor B inhibitor. Um, and they've already done a 12-month interim analysis for this study. Um, and they've shown that Eptacapan resulted in reduction in proteinuria. Um, so again, some positive signs there, but we wait to see the results of the, the final study. If we then move into Avacapan, so this is a C5A receptor blocker. Um, so this is um, this was a study that looked at, this was a phase two study that wanted to look at the effect on kidney biopsy at 26 weeks. Um, and this study wasn't statistically significant, but it did suggest possibly some um, changes in inflammation. So again, something to keep an eye on really. Um, if we move on from C3G to atypical HUS, so we've had eclizumab, but other studies are being looked at. So we, Iptacapan is being explored here, and this is the Applehus phase three study, which is ongoing. Um, then we've also got ravaluzumab, which you mentioned earlier. Um, so ravaluzumab, very similar to eclizumab, but it's more convenient. You can give it every four to eight weeks compared to every one, every two to three weeks with eclizumab. Um, and the phase three trials, um, single arm phase three trials, have shown um, that you can um, essentially resolve uh, TMA in 54 and 78 percent of treatment naive adult and pediatric patients, respectively, and that's within 26 weeks. Um, and it was nice to see that it was um, generally well tolerated. So another treatment option for patients with atypical HUS. Now we move into IgA nephropathy, and I think this is where the number of trials is exploding. Um, but if we look at ravaluzumab again, same drug that was used in HUS, um, this is a C5 inhibitor, I should have said. There's a phase two study ongoing now, which is looking at proteinuria as an endpoint. Then chemdisiran, uh, this is the C5 inhibitor. This too is ongoing, um, but they've got some early data which suggests that there might be some reduction in proteinuria, but also a reduction in circulating C5 levels, which takes us back to some of the patho, uh, gen uh, pathogenicity um, discussions you had earlier. Um, again, avacapan, so this is a C5A receptor blocker. Um, so um, this, it, they did a very small study. This was an open label pilot study, which, um, quite, um, you know, eye-opening results, 50% improvement in three out of seven patients. But, you know, we do need to, to see what happens here. I think that's seven patients. I don't think we'd go around Not starting that. people on drugs quite right, quite now. Um, again, moving into the different a different pathway, the lectin pathway, uh, narsoplimab, um, so again, looking at IgA nephropathy, we've got some interim trial data there, um, and we've got some clinically meaningful reductions in proteinuria, but also stabilization in GFR slopes. Um, but that's more in patients who are high risk with advanced IgA. So again, looking forward to seeing more data on that. Um, back to Ectacapan, this is the factor B inhibitor, again, alternative pathway. Um, so this, their phase two study showed a continuous reduction in proteinuria. Proteinuria is such an important endpoint for us. Um, so we saw less than 40% in the Ectacapan arm and over 28% increase in the placebo arm. So again, important differences there. Um, good side effect profile there as well. So there's a whistle-stop tour of the trials that are currently ongoing. Thank you very much for this impressive overview. 
Uh, are there any safety issues to consider with these agents targeted at complement cask one would expand that there could be some problems yeah. uh, what is the evidence telling us mm -hmm. so I, th I think you're right we have to be careful with these mm -hmm. with these drugs and I think it's important to state that they are still undergoing trials mm -hmm. and we will have a lot more data on them um, safety once the trials have completed mm -hmm. but I think it's reasonable to say that so far certainly mm -hmm. for IGA nephropathy we haven't seen anything mm -hmm. terrible uh, we do need to be mindful of those encapsulated bacteria um, and um, we certainly need to think about um, the effect of C3 inhibitors um, on, on those encapsulated organism infections. So I think we're coming to the end, Vladimir. Uh, we've covered an awful lot, but I'm going to ask you one more question. What other approaches should we be thinking about when it comes to complement-mediated kidney disease? Thank you for the question. So, of course, we have some general approaches uh, which are applicable to all glomerular diseases and also to complement mediated diseases, uh, such as renal protective strategies as inhibition of the renin angiotensin system. And now, also, we have uh, experience also specifically in IG nephropathy that the renal protective effect of SGLT, SGLT inhibitor, SGLT2 inhibitors. And uh, some, some preliminary data suggests that there could be also a place for endothelin inhibition. So it means that uh, also the supportive care, optimized supportive care, will be uh, in, in some way expanded. And it's of course a question what will be finally the place for, for the supportive care and for the uh, immune modulation. And it could be probably personalized in different patients based on the activity of the disease. In kidney biopsy. It is not so well demonstrated for CCG and AHUS, but if they, the patients have proteinuria, of course, they should be, um, or, or they should undergo also the same uh, no protective approaches as patients with other glomerular diseases. Uh, in IG nephropathy, we have many other studies which are also looking and targeting uh, other upstream pathogenetic uh, factors, such as production of galactose deficient IgA or autoantibodies against uh, galactose efficient IgA or B cells or plasma cells and once again we are currently unclear what will be the place of each of these approaches in the treatment of uh, IgA nephropathy or uh, what will be the place for combination of these different approaches in one patient. So uh, I can probably uh, conclude uh, with several take-home messages that uh, complement inhibition is definitely a treatment choice uh, of, uh, for atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. Uh, it seems to be uh, uh, very important and uh, suggesting, uh, suggestive of uh, improving the cause of progressive IgA nephropathy, but we will need to wait until the res results of uh, ongoing clinical trials are finally published. And uh, complement inhibition is uh, currently tested at probably uh, the best targeted treatment in C3 glomeropathy. So, Smita, thank you for this enlightening discussion, and I hope that we will have the chance to meet uh, with this discussion also after the data from ongoing trials are available. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for participating in this activity. Please continue to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.